we have the wonderful Elif Shafak here with us. So I wonder whether you'd be kind of to come up, Elif, now, and then we'll sort of we'll continue. But I just think it's worth continuing that that conversation um, because I've had the the great fortune to have similar conversations with Elif um, over the last few years um, about Europe, about Turkey. I could ask you the same question to begin with before I introduce you to those people who don't know you. Just is there are similarities? Oh, there are, there are lots of similarities, and, and it's quite scary actually to to see the similarities. And sometimes I f watch what's happening in other parts of the world with this strange feeling of déjà vu. You know, I've seen this before. I've seen the beginnings of this pattern before and how fast it slides backwards, almost with a bewildering speed, which leaves very little time to digest, to understand, to analyze, because then the next day something else happens, the next week something else happens. So in Turkey, we've been living with this speed of things for a very long time, and um, the whole nation, the whole country has been sliding backwards very fast. Let's have a little bit of uh, literature before we talk sure. more about, about Turkey. Sure. But um, if you don't know Elif Shafak's work, let me just give you a, um, a little bit of background. Um, Elif is an award-winning novelist. She is the most widely read female writer in Turkey, and she's published in 47 languages. She's also a political commentator and, I would say, a very inspirational public speaker. She writes in both Turkish and in English and has published 15 books. Ten of them are novels, and this year, the outstanding, I've reviewed it myself, the outstanding Three Daughters of Eve, as well as other bestsellers, The Bastard um, of Istanbul and The Forty Rules of Love. She lectures all over the world. She's been showered with many, many awards and has judged many literary prizes, including the Bailey's Women's Prize for fiction, and this year, the Man Booker International Prize. Um, so you're going to do a little bit of a reading from The Daughters of Eve. Yes. And if you tell us a little bit about that book first, because it's wonderful. It's Oxford and Istanbul. It's the 1980s. It's, it's now. It's several decades. It really is about now as well, isn't it? Yes, it's a book that very much talks about what's happening in, in many parts of the world today. Or if I may put it differently, it's a book that talks about confusion and the confusions of our times. There are um, three young women at the heart of the book. They all come from Muslim backgrounds, and yet their relationship with their religion is completely, and with their identity, with their background, is completely different. So we have Shirin, she, who is um, the child of exiled parents, parents who had to escape from fundamentalism and fanaticism. She's British Iranian, and um, she is very critical of all religions. But in particular, she's very critical of Islam because of the mistreatment of women and the lack of gender equality. And then there's Mona, who is Egyptian-American. She wears a headscarf. She's a practicing Muslim. She's a believer. And she complains about Islamophobia because this is something she experiences almost on a daily basis. And then we have Piri, who is the Turkish girl. And she has lots of questions about many things. And jokingly, they call themselves the sinner, the believer, and the confused. <laughs> and this is a book that very much focuses on the journey of the, of the confused. Um, at some point, I wanted to name this book, call this book, The Last Supper of the Turkish Bourgeoisie, <laughs> because it takes place across um, one dinner scene with starters and the main course and, and the desserts. Um, while Piri, the Turkish lady, is attending this bourgeois dinner in Istanbul today, in the year 2016, with flashbacks, we travel back to Oxford University, uh, where she takes a seminar course from a very charismatic but troubling uh, professor who teaches God, a workshop on God. And, and that course opens up a space where lots of issues can be discussed about religion, identity, faith, belongings, etc. But I think what I wanted to do was maybe to reflect what I saw in Turkey and the Middle East and maybe in Europe. Um, and that was quite a bit of a challenge because, as Doris Lessing uh, once said so famously, literature is analysis after the event. 
but sometimes I think we feel compelled to analyze during the event. You know, you want to respond to things while they're happening. So in the year 2016, lots of things happened in Turkey. Um, in, the, in the course of a year and a half, more than 35 terror attacks happened in Turkey. And I remember these dinner scenes, middle class, upper class, whatever, but it was so schizophrenic. One moment people talking about very mundane things like recipes, food, and the next moment they're talking about death because they've just learned that another suicide attack happened outside on the street and suddenly death is very close and you see the people's psychology changing and then the next moment they're talking about something very mundane again and we always talk about politics. Over breakfast, lunch, dinner, we in Turkey constantly we're talking about politics and we're a very divided nation, we're a very polarized nation, we're a very angry nation and what we've lost over the years is the culture of coexistence and the national consensus so I want to read the part in this book where I talk about Piri's background. Uh, she comes from a house that is also badly divided. Her, her mother is very religious, but her mother's understanding of religion is based on fear. Her notion of Allah is based on, on the concept of Jalal. And her father is a modernist, is a Kemalist, is someone who believes in enlightenment, in reason. And he's a man who very much invests in the, in the education of his daughter and supports her education. And like many Democrats in Turkey, he's deeply depressed. Her parents were as incompatible as tavern and mosque. The frowns that descended on their brows the stiffness that infused their voices identified them not as a couple in love, but as opponents in a game of chess. On the faded board of their marriage, they each pushed forward, strategizing the next moves, capturing castles, elephants and viziers, aiming to deliver the ultimate defeat. Each side saw the other as the tyrant in the family, the intolerable one, and longed to say, someday, checkmate, Shah Manad, the sovereign, is helpless. Their marriage had been so deeply woven with mutual resentment that they no longer needed a reason to feel wronged and frustrated. Even at that young age, Peri sensed that love was not, and probably never had been, the reason why her parents were together. In the evenings, she watched her father slumped at the table with plates of mezes distributed around a bottle of rakı, stuffed grape leaves, mushed chickpeas, grilled red peppers, artichokes in olive oil. He would eat slowly, sampling each dish like a fastidious connoisseur, even though the food was no more than a necessity so as not to drink on an empty stomach. I don't gamble, I don't steal, I don't accept bribes, I don't smoke, and I don't go around chasing women. Surely Allah will spare his old creation this much misdeed, Mensur was fond of saying. Ordinarily, he would have a friend or two join him for these lengthy suppers. They would rattle on about politics and politicians, depressed about the state of things. Like the majority of the people in this land, they talked most about the things they liked least. Travel the world, you will see, Everyone drinks differently, Mansur would say. He himself had moved around a fair amount in his youth as a ship's engineer. In a democracy, when a man gets drunk, he cries, what happened to my sweetheart? Where there's no democracy, when a man gets drunk, he cries, what happened to my sweet country? Soon, words would melt into melodies, and they would be singing bouncy Balkan tunes at first, revolutionary Black Sea songs next, and gradually, inevitably, Anatolian ballads of heartbreak and love. Turkish, Kurdish, Greek, Armenian, Ladino lyrics would mix in the air like coiling wisps of smoke. Sitting by herself in a corner, a heaviness of heart would come over Piri. She often wondered what it was that made her father so sad. She imagined sorrow sticking to him like a fine layer of black tar under the sole of his shoe. She could neither find a way to lift his spirits nor stop trying, for she was, as everyone in the family would testify, her father's daughter. From the ornate picture frame on the wall, Atatürk, 
the father of the Turks, would glance down at them, his steel blue eyes flecked with gold. There were portraits of the national hero everywhere, Atatürk in his military uniform in the kitchen, Atatürk in a reading goat in the living room, Atatürk with a coat and kalpak in the master bedroom, Atatürk with silk gloves and flowing cape in the hall. On national holidays and commemorative days, Mensur would hang a Turkish flag with a picture of the great man outside a window for everyone to see. Remember, if it weren't for him, we'd have been like Iran, Mensur often said to his daughter. I would have to grow a round beard and bootleg my own booze. They would find out and flog me in the square, and you, my soul, would be wearing a chador even at your young age. Mensur's friends, school teachers, bank officers, engineers, were just as devoted to Atatürk and his principles. They read, recited, and when inspiration struck, they wrote patriotic poems. Peri enjoyed lingering in the living room, listening to their amiable chatter, the tones and cadences of their voices rising and falling with each new glass, topped up to the brim. They did not mind her presence. If anything, her interest in their conversation seemed to rejuvenate them, filling them with hope for the youth. Thus, Peri stayed around, sipping orange juice from her father's favorite mug, which had the signature of Atatürk on one side and the quote from the national leader on the other. The civilized world is ahead of us. We have no choice but to catch up. Peri loved this porcelain cup, the smooth touch of it against her palm, though it made her slightly regretful each time she finished her drink, as though the chance of catching up with the civilized world had also disappeared. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to um, also compare a little bit Oxford with Istanbul because, because the contrasts are so sharp, you know. Istanbul is a city of amnesia. Turkey is a, is a country of collective amnesia. We have very poor memory. Whereas when you go to a place like Oxford, the accumulation of knowledge over the centuries is quite striking and the sense of continuity. And to me, it's fascinating to see how a once upon a time religious space has been turned into a secular space where you can have science and debates. We across the Middle East have not been able to have that um, transition. So when you go to a place like the Bodleian Library, you see the signs on the walls that show the names of the, of the patrons who have supported the library throughout the centuries. And those centuries were not easy centuries in this country. Lots of things happened. But the support for, the, for knowledge was continuous. Um, whereas if that library had, taken, had, had been in Istanbul, it would probably have been turned into a shopping mall today. We, we just have ruptures. Um, and this was one of the themes that I wanted to explore. How is it that we con constantly draw circles within circles in the Middle East and, and, and cannot learn from the mistakes of the past, cannot accumulate knowledge? Just to give you one maybe final uh, example, in my previous novel, The Architect's Apprentice, it was very interesting for me to explore the story of an observatory uh, in 16th century, both in the Ottoman Empire and in Europe. There were two, they, they used to call them stargazers, two scientists, amazing, one Tycho Barach, one Takiyettin, an Arab uh, scientist living in Istanbul, and two magnificent observatories. Uh, they were built around the same time, wonderful libraries, wonderful scientific instruments, but their fates were so different. The one in Europe stayed, and it paved the way for other observatories. The one in Istanbul was raised down in a year and a half because the ulema said, we should not be watching the skies. It's wrong. Allah should be watching us. It's haram. So it was raised down. What I'm trying to say is, um, constantly we, we experience this in the East. And so for me, to explore those conflicts, to ask questions about these taboos, political, cultural, and sexual taboos, I think is, is, is quite an important part of my work. 
as um, as a writer who I feel also tries to change us through your books, um, whether that's deliberate or not. But I do I sense there is a sense of deliberate attempt there to to try to 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 change us. But are you do how do you marry the two things the the political engagement and the writing of novels? I mean, your novels you can argue, they are novels of ideas, but you you write such beautiful fiction that you don't feel it's thrust down your throat yeah. in any way. But how yeah. how do you do that? They're two such different things, really. To be honest, I, I really don't like it when writers try to teach something or to preach. I find it quite off-putting, actually. But I think it's, a, it's the writer's job to ask questions, difficult questions, if possible, and then leave the answers to the readers. What matters to me is to, to be able to ask those questions and to hopefully reflect a diversity of opinions, voices, because what you lose in authoritarian countries is diversity itself. You know, it's only one interpretation of history, one way of looking at things just imposed on us. So instead of that, writing history with a big capital H, saying, okay, you tell me the Ottoman Empire was so grand, but what did it feel like to be an Armenian silversmith in the 16th century in Istanbul? What did it feel like to be a Jewish miller? What did it feel like to be a concubine or a prostitute accompanying the army? How did they experience those events and turning points? So to ask micro questions about human beings, to try to understand the human being in those macro settings is what I like to do. And you started this beautiful evening with a, with a very powerful question. I think right, when you are a writer from, from wobbly democracies or wounded democracies or non-democracies, like Turkey, like Nigeria, like Egypt, like Pakistan, you do not have the luxury of being apolitical as a writer. If you care about what's happening beyond the door, you start asking political questions. It's a massive challenge for us because as writers, we are very solitary creatures, you know? Um, but I think you have to ask those questions. Also, I come from women's movement, and one of the many wonderful things feminism taught us was the personal is also political. So for me, politics is not only the parliament or what politicians say. It's also in our daily lives. It's much more diffused than that. And I do think that, yes, right, stories do change us uh, in so many ways. I believe in this because they changed me. Uh, as I was growing up throughout my childhood, my early years. And if I may add this, um, I have many readers in Turkey who are very xenophobic. If you ask their opinion, uh, opinion about Armenians, Jews, Turks, uh, sorry, Kurds, Greeks, Alevis, minorities, the things they will say would be mostly negative. But when, you, when they come to me, they say, you know, I've read your novel and it was this character that I loved best, and maybe that character is Jewish or Armenian. I have many homophobic readers. Turkey is a very homophobic country, in addition to being very patriarchal, because they're related. And then they say, you know, I, I cried when this character was hurt, and maybe that character is bisexual or, or gay or transsexual. So I've always wondered, how is it possible that people who are less tolerant, more biased in the public space, when they are alone, when they're reading a novel, they become relatively, just a notch, a bit more open-minded. I think that is a big potential for us because in that inner space, when we are not influenced by other people, because fascism is a collectivistic disease, you know, this mass energy, when we're away from that collectivistic identity, as human beings, we're relatively a little bit more open-minded and open-hearted. And the novel as a genre directly speaks to that inner space. Thank you for opening our minds. Thank you, Elif. Thank you so much. That's my it's mine. I lent her my own copy. <laughs> I do need you to sign it, though, one day. <laughs> Elif Shafak, thank you so much.